Find all back episodes and other information at mattsaudioblog.com. Welcome back to Before the Dragon podcast, breaking down the season two official trailer for House of the Dragon. And thanks once again to Kelly for joining me. Let's get into talking about this season two official trailer in this episode of the podcast. Now, I wondered if these two shots were connected. I suspect they are not. Can you tell anything about uh, it's fire raining down Mm -hmm. on men? Mm -hmm. Uh, Looks like some men are already dead. Um, I wondered if these shots were connected. Now I'm not so sure. I'm wondering if this, because I feel like we saw this shot in a prior trailer and they connected it to a different dragon. Yeah, these are that's the troops that were approaching Rook's Rest. Like so you've got the Darklands and Hey look, there's your three uh your three red stripes. <laughs> yeah, the the Chevron Sun. That's Stoughton and um get the sheep. Yeah. Crosby. All right, I get those two mixed up. But yes, that's those are the three uh the three houses that they had lined up before in the tree line with the ladder. So now would it Moon Dancer be present at a big fight like that? That seems rebellious. That seems like Moon Dancer would not be allowed there. Um, Bela's pretty fierce. She might be there anyway, but I don't think the shots are connected because um, there's not enough light in this shot. There was a whole lot of light in the other shot. Oh wow, yeah, that is way brighter. Um. Do you think that's just a different angle of the shot of uh, Moon Dancer uh, bearing down on Kristen Cole? That's what I think it is. I think it's a shot right before we saw a shot earlier of, of Moon Dancer swooping along the the ground. Mm-hmm. I think that's a shot of the beginning of the swoop. Yeah, she's just higher up at that moment. Yeah, yeah. this is the this is a dive dope. towards the field. Yeah, this is something completely different. Mm-hmm. Definitely a dragon. Lighten some people up. Yeah, this is that Darklin, Stopeworth, Rosby contingency that we're... Uh... Yeah. Probably with some high towers mixed in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. High towers and, and green Targaryens. You thought Masaria was dead, folks. Well, we identified her in previous trailers as well. Um... We didn't say anything, but she was also released in set shots. So you thought Larry Strong won. No, he did not. Missaria lives, ladies and gentlemen. Bad accent and all. Missaria lives. And what does she say? She says, there is more than one way to fight a war. What does she mean? What could she possibly mean by that? Who's she saying it to? As we see a shot of some guy holding a torch near a tunnel, very similar to two guys that we saw walking into a tunnel in a prior trailer, and some money being exchanged. He's saying all this, there's more than one way to fight the war. Subterfuge, bribery. There's there's guys uh, that could be lynch mobbers. There's guys who are paying other guys off. There's somebody strangling somebody. I Is that Helena? Don't think they're getting strangled now. <laughs> well, I mean, it could be a loving kind of strangle. I believe it's it's more in the uh, caress uh, category. <laughs> oh, I thought that ne- that hand went around that neck pretty good. Um, I, th- I thought I thought that that was a little bit of uh, the rough sex kind of stuff happening there. I think maybe, but maybe uh, very very light play <laughs> also that ring again we, we mentioned it earlier oh it's damon okay then a, a knife going at a green dress well that could be anybody in king's landing <laughs> typically you think allison any kind of identifying markers here on the knife well, of the knife or of the hands. In the Anybody previous tell us who this is. In the previous trailers there was a shot of a knife being held to Helena's throat. Mm. I wonder if this is the same. Same knife? 
It was remember. tiny like that, but it, I couldn't see it clearly. It could be, possibly. Helena likes to wear green, too. Just like mom. Yeah. And then there's a shot of people looking very distraught. Mm -hmm. Ready to riot. Ready to voice well, their opinion. A bunch of people over here trying to get over here, but there's there a line of gold cloaks. There, there, there is there is people, but this guy looks really impatient. There's a guy in the center yeah. who just like he, uh -huh. he he he's like, who the hell are you? Why are you standing in our way? It's like Taylor Swift tickets went on sale over here, and they all have daughters at home, yeah, and they don't want to be. They all got yeah. caught on the wrong side <laughs> of the bodyguards of the, yeah. of the bouncers. <laughs> yeah. um, this this guy right in the front with the brown hat. He's wearing a brown hat. He's got some words for that guard. He's so, yeah. What he thinks of the crappy service that Ticketmaster has given them. Yes, he is. He's in, uh, implying uh, a way that that cloak might have gotten yellow. Yeah, and then some, something about his mother. Yeah, this guy just wanted to see Taylor. Uh, <laughs> he was, he's just a big fan. With the he's just a big fan. He's just like, man, I just want tickets. <laughs> Come on, man. I just want to take me and my girlfriend. Man, this was gonna. This was. We were oh, it's her birthday. Oh. <laughs> man, I got. I got the money, man. I got the man, money. Just give me the tickets. I blew it last year. I can't blow it again. And then this guy over here, he's actually against the whole rest of the crowd. On the far left, um, he's, he's the guy who says, yeah, you should have seen Frank Sinatra. Yeah, he brought Back a in my day, <laughs> You didn't have to rush through guards to get tickets from Ticketmaster. Uh, Frank Sinatra <laughs> was much better. Than Taylor Swift ever will be. <laughs> but he came armed. He brought a he brought a cane. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. ready to he's, throw down. He's, he's just like he's trying to enforce the fact that Frank Sinatra was a superior performer. Elvis, you should have seen Elvis. Kids these days. <laughs> Even in nineteen seventy four. <laughs> Vegas exactly. days. Most memorable days. <laughs> when he used to snort coke and then get mad because the press reported it, and he'd talk about it to the audiences. Those were the days, not this Taylor Swift crap. Uh, anyway, uh, they're so mad <laughs> that Allison and Helena have to run away. Run away! Run away! They got the last two tickets, so everyone's mad at them. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta, we gotta get out of here. Um, <laughs> Helena and Allison are both wearing veils. We saw them in another shot in another trailer wearing veils, riding a top, a cart, where people were throwing flowers at them. Doesn't look like they're throwing flowers at them anymore. Looks like they're wanting to throw yeah. trash at them now. Yeah. Um, they are running for their lives. They are scared. And I'm so uh, proud of Helena, though. Like, Helena, like, reaches back for her mom. Like, Helena's, like, a little scaredy bug, but she, like, made sure she had her mom's hand and that they were going to get out of there safely, as you should do in a club. Always hold hands. And if there's yeah. ever a disruption, look for the exits and head there calmly but quickly. <laughs> Helena wasn't going to leave her club buddy behind. Helena is a good teammate. Exactly. Surprising, you know. She's. I wouldn't expect her to be so brave and bold, and yet she made sure she had her mom. And that know, they were she gonna plays with spiders. Her. Is she really that much of a scared to get in social situations? I suppose. I don't know. Uh -huh. I thought I would have thought so. Okay, maybe she just had another vision, and she realizes that they need to get the heck out of there. True. Oh yeah, she knew. She knew where the exit was. Going, so she says, "Come on, mommy." <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like I've seen our way through the crowd in the near future. The man on the left shall let us pass. That's the phrase that she said. <laughs> yeah. Rather than the beast beneath the board. She said that three days ago, and now she knows what it means. She knew. <laughs> but yeah, they book it. The man with the cane will let us pass because he understands that Taylor Swift is nothing as good as Frank Sinatra ever was. <laughs> uh, speaking of running, now horses are running. Unicorn. Unicorn, probably Kristen Cole, if it's a unicorn. I think so, or at least a Kingsguard. Uh, and there's other shots that are from other trailers where 
uh, horses take tumbles and everything. We don't include them in our screenshots here for time's sake. Oh, this is a new shot. This is the Red Queen Maleys is our mm -hmm. dragon. And the queen who never was, uh, Rainies, mm -hmm. is our rider. I love the spikes. I don't think that we saw that much detail. Well, we did see Maleys up close in the dragon pit. But this is one of the coolest shots. The way that the camera kind of moves as it's following, Rainies following it. Or, yeah, it's like stabilized in like the second row seating. Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. This this is this is the Disney ride experience. Yes. <laughs> that we need uh HBO Max to come up with. That we need Max to come up with. That we need Warner <laughs> Brothers Discovery. Uh who needs Harry Potter? You need who needs this ride? Calm down with the zooming. You're making me motion sick. <laughs> Calm down with the zooming. Zooming in and out in and out is making me motion sick. I can't, can't stare at it for too long. <laughs> Nervous habit with the wheel. Um, <laughs> that's Rook's Rest in the background, folks. That is the same building that we saw before. Uh, it is in the top left corner of the shot. Uh, it's the single tower. And the right? single tower and the color of the stone is what yeah. comes in the way. Like However, a square... I'm supposing that the ocean is actually behind Rainies in the shot. But the water. It does look like it gradiates the ground. Yeah, it looks like there's a kind of a cliff drop off. Right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, Rainies is, uh, I'm sorry, Maylies is considered like a queen dragon. So she has, she lays eggs and she's t typically, they've got these like um, long uh, horns that come out around their, uh, their jaw, up their head, along their chin. Um, to kind of look like a crown around their head. Oh, yes. There she goes. She's howling. We have a shot, a singular shot of Maylies taking a bow. <laughs> Saying hello. Saying, I'm diving, I'm getting ready to dive down on something. Got to go up a little bit before I shoot down. Taking a big breath so that she can breathe some fire probably, right? Yeah, about to unleash some fire. Perhaps. Oh, yes. If Rainey's is at Rook's Rest, and we know that that shot of fire raining down is of people who were also at Rook's Rest, perhaps the shot of Maylie's taking her big breath <laughs> it's just before is right that. before she lays fire on all those guys and kills them. That seems more proportionate than Moon Dancer doing all that damage. Yes, I think Moon Dancer's just diving to chase after Kristen Cole. Oh, do you see here on Melee's how high up her wings attach, like right under her armpit, like at her, above her, even her waistline? Oh, so that's kind of the way I'm trying to notice. It slims her. her. It slims her hips. <laughs> yeah, it does. Effective. Yes, she's a very ladylike figure. <laughs> Or her slims her waist, not her hips. Then here is a shot of Eamon. He got fire all around him, baby. These two shots, this shot and the next shot together, I was curious what you think, but it looked to me because he looks like he's dodging fire. Right. From like that is being shot almost directly at his saddle. And then in the next shot is, well, just before this, Vagar is shooting fire behind her. It looked like Vagar was shooting fire at Aegon, or Eamon. I was like, <laughs> he was oh, annoying. <laughs> uh, probably like trying to shoot fire past Eamon. I don't know. It's, you know, angry grandma. She got like, you know, he was trying to tell her to do something she didn't want to do. So she kind of spat a little fire at him. <laughs> you shouldn't boss your elders around. That's for sure. Exactly. She was putting that um, young whippersnapper into place. <laughs> yeah. Vagar's like, Vagar's like, you know, I, I basically took it easy on you when you were a kid and let you ride me. And what are you doing bossing me around like this? I don't want to kill another <laughs> dragon. Because we know we've seen shots of Vagar with the same troops around it in the teaser trailer, flying out of the woods or over the woods. God, so just lurching. Like, she is so Rick big. Is at Rook's Rest and likely Vagar and Amon are at Rook's Rest Probably not going to like each other too much. They're probably going to shoot a little fire at each other, right? 
But in the midst of that, Vagar shoots a little fire back at him. Vagar's like, I'm going to show you what. I'm going to. It's like, you don't mess with me, whippersnapper. You don't mess with me. (laughs) Fire back uh, at Eamon, perhaps. Perhaps not. I love it, though. That that was great. (laughs) Vagar, that is an ugly tongue. Girl is, girl is looking rough. That's, <laughs> it, well, I mean, you sit around for 200 years and eat nothing but sheep. See what your tongue turns into. The life of Vagar is amazing. Yes. It, it is squandered. Her years of experience are squandered on stupid Amen. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's basically the last <sighs> shot, right? Yeah, no, not quite, because uh, then the, the I guess probably the one of the final shots is Rhaenyra saying uh, war is coming. War is coming. And she got a friend, little friend here, too. Who is this? Yeah, friend? we saw him at the end of last season. This is Vermithor, perhaps? Mm-hmm. Um, Vermithor has <laughs> been around for a while. Vermithor just kind of hangs around on Dragonstone, don't let nobody talk to him. We'll occasionally entertain a song from Damon. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and uh, reward Damon with a little bit of a fire shot um, just to let you know that you're heard. You heard Damon is good tune, good tune. But now Vermithor is standing directly behind Rhaenyra. Probably not going to eat Rhaenyra. I'd say that uh, Rhaenyra is a welcome guest in mm-hmm. Vermithor's house right here um in fact who might Rhaenyra be facing that Vermithor would possibly be saying hey you ain't gonna mess with my girl that's the question that I have well the person that they're if there is someone where the camera is they would have to be in I think like the one of the caves or somewhere in um Dragonstone right so it has to be an ally of Rhaenyra well one would think that doesn't necessarily mean that Ver- Vermithor wouldn't protect Rhaenyra from anyone. True. Even from True. Friend or foe. Because dragons don't, don't like to be bothered. Dragons don't like to be bothered, man. Now, if well, Vermithor is tolerating Rhaenyra, <laughs> but may not tolerate anybody else. Because Vermithor looks pretty mad there. Yeah, uh, they often in the books call him what, like that hoary old beast. Is yeah. what they usually call him. Yeah. H-O-A-R-Y-40. <laughs> they are in the caves of uh, Dragonstone. Rhaenyra is wearing her reddish outfit. Cape. Ne- necklace. She, she does have the necklace on. Or a necklace on. I can't tell. I can't get mm. close enough to be able to. The pixels. <laughs> uh, the pixels. Because see, that looks darker to me. It does. It looks like there's more white going on than a, than a chain. Yes. Pearls. Necklace watch. Right. Necklace watch. 2024. <laughs> as opposed to right. hair watch and all those other things that we did. <laughs> That's all of the shots from the trailer that we have to discuss in a non-spoiler fashion. We have lots of feedback. But Kelly, did you learn anything by looking at these shots more closely? Oh my gosh, yes. Of course, there were some things I already missed that I had thought I understood what they were showing me, but they were completely uh, misleading me. There was a few things, uh, like the hands um, being raised. I thought it looked like in a, you know, Walking Dead scary, you know, hands up, uh, get us out of here clean, but it may have been uh, more like to touch a, uh, um, a procession as it went by. So... That, that I definitely did not catch. Uh, a couple other things, maybe identifying the dragons a little bit easier. That's about it, I think. I'm sure there's more I'm forgetting. What about you? I had a lot of fun. You educated me a lot on house sigils, on uh, wings, uh, on, on dragons, about <laughs> noticing where the wings meet the dragon's <laughs> torso. Um, didn't even think about considering that because, you know, I'm not a big dragon fan. Oh! <gasps> Did he say that? Did He'll be converted, he folks. He'll be converted. Uh, she's going to convert me. Uh, other people have been trying to convert me of sane thought into sane thought huh. with their feedback. Uh, so 
let's go through some <laughs> of this, shall we? I've done lots of podcasts, Kelly, since the last time you were here, although most of them have only been in the last four months because I didn't do any podcasts for a little while myself. <laughs> uh, but we heard from our good friend, Nicole, who is at Nightwolf Nim on all of the social medias and on YouTube. Uh, and this is in regards to the conversation I had with Heath. Uh, but I had Heath on to talk about his new movie, which you all should check out, which I have a credit on as a music consultant. Um, Heath uh, had talked about Patty Constantine being snubbed for the Emmys. And Nicole says, totally with Heath about Patty's Emmy snub. I think HBO has a great track record with casting young actors. This was me being worried about the person that they had casted for Egg in the new Night of the Kingdom series. But evidently, uh, she says that she has faith in Nina Gold, I suppose, who usually does most of the casting for Game of Thrones stuff. And the, yes, granted, Maisie Williams, Sophie Turner, they've got a pretty good track record. Isaac, yeah, they've got an okay track record. I wasn't a big fan of the actor brand. Sorry. I, Isaac didn't really do it for me. Um, so that would be my argument, Nicole. Uh, also, Nicole says... Uh, as far as casting Henry Cavill as possibly uh, Aegon the Conqueror, she says that's just a wishful fifth fan cast. He's going to be doing Warhammer for Prime, so I think he'll be too busy. My heart hurts about the, uh, the shelving of the Snow sequel for Game of Thrones. Um, also, she enjoyed my uh, George R. R. Martin impersonation which really isn't all that good. <laughs> On Eric versus Eric, the podcast I just recently, most recently released, uh, my nemesis, Patman23, comes aboard to say these things. Great podcast today on Sir Eric and Sir Arik. I can't argue against the greatness of your traitor or no, you'll always be my bro, which I recommend does depend on your bit that Eric and Eric are pronounced the same. What do you mean bit, Patman23? It's not a bit. That's the way it was intended to be read. I'm telling you, that's George R. R. Martin's strange sense of humor, the same way that he likes to kill babies right in front of you in some books. Um, it's a strange sense of humor. It's supposed to be Eric and Eric. And Kelly does not agree with me or in this take at all, nor does 90% of the readership. <laughs> <laughs> but when the people from History of Westeros say that they're not sure how to pronounce it, I take it as a slight opening that I can open up and ram right down your throat, Patman23, my nemesis. That's who you are. <laughs> Kelly is offended by my very gestures and tone of voice. I'm scared. <laughs> but uh, in the case of the song, Patman23 does support my... Uh, assertion. I even heard the part about where you said that I'd probably already turned the podcast <laughs> off. You scoundrel. Now that is fair. Batman 23. Because I did not think that you would stick around to the end of a podcast that insisted on calling them Eric and Eric. Thank you so much for your feedback, Batman 23. As you know, I love you, but you are my absolute internet nemesis. Just in general, on, on our podcasts and on our, especially on our YouTube videos, uh, Isabella says, I'm so happy I found this channel. The editing on this made my day. I am quite the editor. You'll see sloppy edits all over the place. I'm sure that's what made your day. Thank you, Isabella, for stopping by uh, and for commenting. Our buddies. That was the oh, one that, that was the one where you were talking to yourself, jester hat, regular hat, jester hat, regular hat. I think I do that on all of them now. That well, okay. <laughs> I saw it in the first one you did, but I only that, have I'm listening to most of them. That's that's my shtick. I should get <laughs> two minutes for high sticking. Well, maybe it was the first one she mentioned it on. <laughs> yeah, uh, Bubba or Catfish, but probably Bubba from Double P Media says. I want more Rook's Rest talk. And that was in our feedback. Well, maybe it was on our feed, our Rook's Rest podcast. I thought it was on our feedback podcast. Maybe I just 
placed the the comment in the wrong place. Top five most horrific moments with guess that guess what that featured Bubba and Catfish from Double P Media. See how clever I am at putting things together so they run together just like a trailer. I'm so good at this. Um, ha. Uh, but uh, Nicole is back and she says that among our top five most horrific moments, which were pretty horrific, uh, to be perfectly honest. I think catfishes were more horrific than anybody else's. Um, but they were the most heartwarming moments for him. He did present them. <laughs> yeah, uh, but uh, the Shireen and the Hodor really got me more than anything else. Uh, uh, the named characters that were innocents, the Red Wedding, especially Cat witnessing Rob being killed, but also the show adding the extra horror with Talissa and the baby, uh, baby Ned. She was going to name it after Rob's father. It was already named after Rob's father. And that was horrific. Uh, the red vipers eye gouging. Ah! And with uh, laughing out loud hysterically. Um, the Doran plot line, I'll never be over this show, ruining the Sand Snakes and uh, an, a double laughing out loud, rolling on the floor, crying emoji for <laughs> catfish, calling Jamie, throwing Bran out the window, giving him flying lessons. Yes. <laughs> uh, that was a good one, catfish. As I said, you were horrible. Uh, but also on the top five most terrific moments, uh, this guy really goes by White Wolf, even though that's not really his handle. Um, but Irish Joe says, Viserys' death was horrific. Not House of the Dragon Viserys, but Game of Thrones Viserys uh, was horrific. But at the same time, I did feel bad for him. He constantly got screwed over. He basically raced Danny, and they had to sell their jewels and the final straw that began his cruel behavior was selling his mother's crown. Now that's stuff from the books. It wasn't really in the show, but it's good context to have because everybody should be defending Viserys, right? I mean, any Viserys. And no. I mean, <laughs> if you've got the extra energy. This is, this is a problematic argument to have, um, <laughs> which you know, I kind of agree. Uh, in my personal opinion, Danny should have just given Viserys an egg for him to set sail to Dorne and marry the princess that he was supposed to marry in the books. Well, uh, he probably would have not been dead if he had done that. Um, but, you know, what's Danny going to do? Been kind of cruel to her the whole time. I mean, let, let Drogo do Drogo things. That's what I always say. Um, that's just what I say. And yes, this would be a horrible way to die. Good God, that would be a horrible way to die. Again, I know I'm going to get hate for that opinion, but it's just what I think. Okay, Irish Joe. So brave. So brave. You are entitled uh, to your opinion. Bonus comment, and this one actually disturbed me quite a bit. The actress who played the Septa, and this is the one that Cersei waterboarded, actually developed an absolute fear being waterboarded. It's been documented that she would wake up screaming that something had gone wrong on set and they accidentally killed her via from suffocating. Oh, she had to put a lot of money into therapy and medicine. Oh no, I, I, on screen, I didn't care what happens, but if this really affected the actor or actress, I feel seriously bad for them. I've done some small roles in theater and I can only imagine the terror I would go through if something like that happened yeah yikes yikes that poor actress you have to go through that after just this is what dave and dan does to people oh <laughs> i've been saying this since season five <laughs> Game of Thrones. This is you give all of us ptsd <laughs> and gave all of us ptsd uh, more on the feedback pod uh deeply downside says this has become one of my favorite House of the Dragon Conversations, keep it up. Aww. Thank you. We shall. Hopefully Aww. you've enjoyed Kelly uh, giving you some actual conversation as opposed to me just spouting words, which is what I tend to do. Uh, Nicole also says, great feedback from everyone. 
and gives everybody a nice round of applause and says, now pass me your fool's hat because I called it the God's Eye 2 on the trailer. Um, yes, the Isle of Faces, Patman 23, makes the God's Eye when you're looking at the lake from above. That's why I called it the God's Eye. I know the lake's called the God's Eye. It's called the God's Eye because it's got the God's Eye. But the Isle of Faces is actually what makes the shape of the eye in the lake. Patman 23. Gave me a lot of trouble for that on the internet, as he often does. And rightfully so. I mean, I'm completely wrong. It is called the Isle of Faces. But I got my reasons. They're not good oh. reasons, but I got them. Uh, thank you all so much for your feedback. Kelly, any thoughts about any of those great thoughts? Uh, I was just trying to think for the God's Eye versus the Isle of Faces. Like, I think if you were to ask somebody, like, what color is your eye? They wouldn't say white, you know? Like, the eye, when you say your eye is, you think of the iris, which is, like, the thing in the center. So I think the island being the thing in the center, the God's Eye, makes sense. I can understand like the confusion. Logic? I understand your confusion. The Patman 23. Even Kelly hates you now. Well... No, that's not what she's saying at all. Um, but here's what I'm saying. here's what we're going to be doing, folks, for uh, season two of House of the Dragon, because a lot of people have now started to be asking, like, how are you going to cover this show? Are you going to do that stupid thing where you have panels all the time and it's strung out over three episodes because you can't I can't stop talking for four hours? Well, look where we are in this Justice trailer review. We are now close to three hours of talking about this trailer in a spoiler-free fashion. We haven't even got to the spoiler section yet. So what are we going to be doing this time around on season two for House of the Dragon in terms of this podcast covering it? Well, just like the last time we had a season of House of the Dragon, you will be getting an initial reaction, at least from me, on Monday mornings when you wake up. It should be available for you to watch or to listen to on YouTube or whatever podcast app that you're using. I always give an initial reaction. I usually record them on Sunday nights right after I watch the episode. And I say a lot of crazy things, which then people come back at me on. And that is perfectly fine. I want to hear from you at the letter B, the number four, the dragon pod on the socials. Use that same spelling for the YouTube. You can also send emails to Matt's audioblog at gmail.com. And sometimes maybe a panelist will drop by. Generally, my panelists don't like being up late on Sunday nights talking to me for hours about an episode that they just watched. They probably want to watch it again before they talk about it. And I don't think we're really going to be doing panelist podcasts this year anyway. The Everybody's schedule is so weird and things are just kind of crazy on my end as well. So we won't be doing that, but in place of that, what we're going to have is the Fan Call-In Show. Now, the Fan Call-In Show is something that I started way back when in for Game of Thrones at Podcast Winterfell, starting with Season 2 of that particular show. But it's not that new of an idea. For years and years and years, AM radio stations have been having... People call in to talk about certain issues or whatever that they're bringing about. I mean, that's been going on since practically the 60s, I believe, or maybe even earlier. So that's not a big deal, except for I want you, you, the fans, to actually talk directly to me. And this was what made it fun for when we were podcasting about Lost. There were lots of shows that were doing this, The Black Rock, um, I was doing one with two other Lost podcasts, and we were all getting together and just getting together with fans and talking about what we had just seen right after a new episode of Lost Air. Now, we're not going to be doing it the same night. We're going to be doing it on Monday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern time, and it's going to be done via a Zoom call. So there'll be a couple of ways that you can join. You can join by either just calling in on your phone or by joining on a Zoom browser. The invite link will always be at my website, mattsaudioblog.com. All of the information is under a page there called the fan call-in is back. 
or something to that effect. You click on that link and all of the information you need to join our call to speak to me directly is right there. And you don't have to just speak to me if you wish. There's going to be other fans there. Or you can just sit back and listen. We don't mind if you're a lurker and you just want to hear what we're saying. That is absolutely fine as well. And you don't have to join with a video call. You can leave your video off. If you want to remain anonymous, that is perfectly fine with me. I'll need some kind of handle to call you by when I talk to you in the course. And we're going to talk to about five or six people each Monday night after a new episode of House of the Dragon airs. So it's the Monday night following a new episode airing on a Sunday, 8 p.m. Eastern. Again, all of the information is at mattsaudioblog.com. Also, some of my panelists may show up and they will be there. They kind of get an open-ended thing. They can come in, stay as long as they want, leave whenever they want. And that way I get to have them on my podcast this year because it's the only way that they can really fit me into their schedule. And I love having their great thoughts because everybody's thoughts are better than mine usually. And so I love having great thoughts. I want your great thoughts on Monday evenings at 8 p.m. Eastern via the Zoom call. Again, all of the information is at mattsaudioblog.com. M-A-T-T-S-A-U-D-I-O-B-L-O-G dot com. So be sure to join us for those fan call-in shows. Again, if you want to offer an opinion, or if you're just there to hear other people's opinions, we want you to be part of our community. One of the things that I am obviously most notable for in any fandom is my ability to analyze how the music in the show accentuates what you're seeing on the screen. It's the thing that's kind of become my trademark, my what everybody knows me by. You know, that this is the thing that I am most famous for. And I know you haven't gotten a lot of that in the last couple of years because there hasn't been anything new music wise to really break down and analyze. But once a new show starts, once a new season comes back, there'll be plenty of new music from Ramin Jabadi. And I will be spending time breaking down new themes or seeing how older themes are being reused in that way in order to accentuate the story, to help be as much of a part of a narrator for this story as the script is. That's what I do with the music analysis. And it is going to be its own separate podcast slash YouTube presentation each and every week. That way, if you're someone who is not into the music, you can simply skip over that episode and say, yeah, I'm not going to watch that. Or yeah, I'm not going to download that particular podcast episode because that's not for me. It doesn't have to be something that you have to try to skip through amidst all of the other content that we are giving you. So those will be coming out on their own. Now, I will say this also. Last time, last season, two years ago, we started a little game called Seven Hells. And that was where if we had drawn by random a particular character who had cussed or what have you, then if I had drawn that name, I would have to then pay a special kind of punishment. There are about 40 punishments left on the board. So I will be continuing to play Seven Hells. I'm not holding any of the other people who show up on shows with me to this same stickler. But I will actually be playing Seven Hells and paying punishments if that is the case. I've also made the rules much more tougher for me. I have to randomly draw two names and it's only if they appear in the episode at all. They don't have to say cuss words. They don't have to say a dragon's name like they did in the last season. This time around, all they have to do is be in the episode, and then I have to pay a punishment. And I will pay those punishments on the fan call-in show. So that's another reason to be able to tune into the fan call-in shows or to want to tune into the fan call-in shows is to see me in agony as I host these calls, paying specific punishments. Uh, As an example, there's one where uh, I have to do Elmo Tully all day long, which means I have to be in the voice of Elmo. I don't necessarily have to dress up like Elmo, but I have to do the pretty voice. I'm going to have to work on that. I'm going to have to practice it. 
Well, I really don't know how to do Elmo. I have to learn how to do Elmo. So you'll have to forgive me. And it may be really bad, but I'll be in pain nonetheless. And you can witness and laugh at that pain with me during the fan call-in show. So once again, Matt's audioblog.com. That's where you find all of the information for the fan call-in shows. So hopefully that gives you some enticement to stick with us this particular season. If you have any suggestions for any kind of programming that we do in this particular season, I'd love to hear from that too. Once again, you can contact me at the letter B, the number four, the dragon pod on the socials. You can use that same spelling for our YouTube and leave comments in our videos. Also folks, please Continue to subscribe. We've had a lot of growth in our community this year, especially since I started doing the kind of preview podcasts that I've been doing. And I really appreciate that. I want the whole family to grow more. And so if you can go ahead and hit that subscribe button, if you're getting the audio podcast or if hit the subscribe button on the YouTube, get your notifications, like our videos, all of that stuff really helps me to help our community to grow. It gets us more out there so that more people see it, so that more people join in, so that we have a stronger contingent of voices talking about House of the Dragon. And that pretty much wraps up what we're going to be doing for this particular season. It also wraps up our spoiler-free podcast. There were three of them. Be sure and go back and check out the previous episodes if you're just happening upon this one so that you get the full context of me and Kelly talking once again, thanks so much to Kelly for joining me for these. We do have one more conversation left for you, which will be coming out in a couple of days. Uh, that is our spoiler conversation. It will be full of book spoilers. It won't be for the non-book readers if they don't want to be spoiled. Of course, anybody, if they want to be spoiled, is more than welcome to join us. But in the meantime, thanks so much for joining us for these last three episodes. And thanks to Kelly for her great contributions. This is Matt. Take care. Find all back episodes and other information at mattsaudioblog.com.